King Joffrey has finally got his comeuppance, but who did it? Let's look at who was in a position to off Joff. Hey fellow Game of Thrones fans, it's Jan here for Flicks in the City. What is it about Game of Thrones and whacking people at weddings? First the Starks got it in the neck in season 3's Red Wedding, and then Joffrey got all choked up in season 4's Purple Wedding. Ok, so nobody died at Tyrion and Sansa's wedding, but it wasn't exactly a barrel of laughs now, was it? And don't forget Jamie Lannister's gentle reminder to Loras Tyrell that if Loras actually married Cersei, she'd murder the Knight of Flowers in his sleep. Anyone would think that George R. R. Martin had something against marriage. Anyway, the big question the purple wedding left us with was, who killed Joffrey? So just who are Westeros's most wanted? Yes, Tyrion has been accused of killing his nephew by Cersei, who says that Joffrey pointed at his uncle as he died. He does have plenty of reasons to loathe Joffrey, not least the relentless humiliation he suffered during the wedding festivities, including the sick spectacle of the War of the Five Kings. He did have plenty of opportunity as the king's cupbearer at the wedding, and Sansa does flee the scene of the crime, maybe because she knew what her husband had done, or maybe because Tyrion had arranged for her to get out of harm's way in case he was caught. But we all know that Tyrion has an unfortunate history of being accused of crimes he didn't commit. Remember Caitlyn accusing him of Bran's attempted assassination? And Lysa accusing him of murdering her husband John Arryn, the king's hand prior to Ned Stark? Ok, so he did tell his squire Podrick to pay the dwarf entertainers after the wedding, adding that we'll have to find another way to thank the king. But although Tyrion's small in stature, he's big in brain, which means he'd be way too clever to put himself so obviously in the firing line. Had he actually done the deed, I don't think he'd be standing round picking up the incriminating goblet after the event. But with Mother of Madness Cersei on the case, let's just say he's going to need a good lawyer. Or alternately, someone a bit skillful in a skirmish to fight for him in a trial by combat situation just like Bronn did at the Eyrie. And so to the bride. Marjorie Tyrell certainly knows her way around the politics of power. She married Renly Baratheon despite knowing he was a lover of her brother Loras. She won over Joffrey with flattery when Loras asked him to marry her in repayment for the Tyrells helping the Lannisters win Blackwater. And she's worn her I Heart Joffrey t-shirt well ever since then, with a little slip in episode 1 of season 4 when she commented sarcastically to her grandmother Lena that if Joffrey chose her wedding necklace, it'd probably be made of dead sparrow heads. Based on her own experience and Sansa's, she was fully aware of the nature of the beast she was marrying. Maybe she thought that if she were going to throw herself willingly into the lion's den, it would be wise to make sure the one with the most vicious bite was out of the way. Yes, yeah, she's been able to control Joffrey up to this point, getting him to wave to his people and give his leftovers to the poor. But how long would it be before he'd be beyond her control as happened to Cersei? I mean, just look at Joffrey's disgusting reenactment of the War of the Five Kings and his treatment of Tyrion at the feast. With Joffrey dead, it's likely Marjorie would wed his much better behaved brother Tommen. Game set and match. Marjorie then. Oh, and she certainly had her chance to dispense with the malicious monarch. After all, she was beside him throughout the wedding festivities, handled his gold goblet and even fed him his pie. And she didn't rush to his side to help him like Cersei did as he lay dying on the floor. Also, was Joffrey pointing at Tyrion or was he actually pointing at Marjorie? Plus, getting rid of Cersei's pride and joy would doubtless give Marjorie a bit of added revenge on her mother-in-law for her reigns of Castamere threat last season. Could Grandaddy Tywin have tired of Joffrey? As terrifying as Tywin is, would Joffrey really cower before him for much longer? Could he really have continued to order the king to his chambers once he was a married man? Perhaps Tywin thought it was time for a more likeable Lannister to take the Iron Throne, and therefore make his life and position as hand easier. But most importantly, the new blood would be pliable. Step forward Tommen, it's your turn. Interestingly enough, if you look really closely, you can see Tywin protects Tommen from seeing Joffrey die. So how would Tywin have done it? Well the man's a master of machinations and it's not like he doesn't have experience with this sort of wedding now is it? Perhaps the new sword that Tywin gifted Joffrey for his wedding was actually laced with poison. So when Joffrey used it to cut the wedding pie, it poisoned the PC8. The dead dove we see in the pie was doubtless caused by Joffrey striking it with his sword, but it's still an interesting way to foreshadow his death. But wouldn't others have eaten the pie at the feast and therefore been affected too? Well yes, but we never 
never actually see anyone eat the pie, though we do see Elena and Tywin with a fork full of something. But surely as king, Joffrey would be the first to scoff down his piece. And well, once you've seen the king drop dead after eating his pie, I'm guessing that might put you off yours. And remember, Joffrey's new sword, the Widow's Whale as he names it, was actually melted down from Ned Stark's sword ice. And wouldn't that just be a delightful irony, the kind that Tywin would doubtless enjoy, to know that Joffrey died by the same blade that killed Ned Stark? The sword may not have caused the Widow's Whale this time, but it certainly led a mother to mourn. The Red Priestess is definitely dark and full of terrors, but was it really Miss Scarlet with the black magic in the dining room? Let's look at the evidence. She's been involved in a death by poisoned wine before. Remember Maester Cressen in season two who tried to poison Melisandre? Well, they both drank the same poisoned wine, but Melisandre is fine while Cressen keeled over blood trickling from his nose. Then there's Melisandre's attempt to show Stannis Baratheon the power of King's blood using the blood of Gendry, Robert Baratheon's bastard son. She had Stannis throw leeches fat with Gendry's blood into fire while naming three usurpers he wanted dead. The men he named were Rob Stark, Balon Greyjoy and Joffrey Baratheon. Well, Rob and Joffrey are already dead. So is Stannis Sandre the dark force behind Joffrey's earthly departure? Or was it just coincidence? I bet Balon Greyjoy hopes so. Sansa certainly had more than enough reasons to do away with the king. He beheaded her father in front of her despite agreeing to show him mercy and later forced her to look at Ned's head on a spike. And when she initially refused, he had one of his men strike her. He threatened her with a crossbow in front of the whole court before ordering her to be beaten. And his lies about the incident with Aya and Butcher's boy Micah led to Sansa's direwolf lady being killed. Not to mention Joffrey's persistent jibes during his wedding about her dead family and that disgusting display of Rob Stark's death in the War of the Five Kings. The list is endless, and she certainly had the opportunity. Remember when Joffrey kicked his gold goblet away from Tyrion to humiliate his new cupbearer? Well, it went under Sansa's table, and it was Sansa who picked it up and handed it back to Tyrion. Perhaps that gave her just enough time to secrete something sinister in the goblet. And there's the fact that people who flee the scene of a crime tend to look a little bit guilty but she does seem a little surprised when Dantos turns up to take her away. And let's face it, she hasn't exactly displayed the same killer instinct as her sister Aya. Yes, he's got motive. Remember, Joffrey was going to have him drowned in wine in season two until Sansa and the Hound intervened, telling the king it would be bad luck to kill someone on his name day. And when Dantos performed at the wedding as the king's fool, Joffrey egged on the crowd to pelt him with food. Plus, Dantos was there ready to whisk off Sansa once the king hit the deck, telling her that if she wanted to live, she had to leave. And then there's a small matter of the necklace Dantos gave Sansa in episode one of season four. Why was he quite so insistent she take it? Do you believe that family heirloom story? He was at the wedding festivities as well, so maybe he could have interfered with the feast. After all, he does know his way around a barrel of wine. But surely Dantos is too much of a drunken fool to orchestrate the death of the king by himself, right? Ah, uh, Peter Baelish, one of the most dangerous and least trustworthy men in Westeros. A man whose influence is felt everywhere. He's been conspicuous by his absence in episodes one and two of season four. Okay, so his ship is supposed to have left for the Vale of Erin in season three. But just because he doesn't seem to be around doesn't mean events are beyond his control. After all, like Varys, he has his spies. For example, male prostitute Oliver, who, after sleeping with Loras in season three, found out about the Tyrells' plan to marry Loras to Sansa. And this season, Oliver's been keeping Oberyn Martell entertained and Littlefinger informed too, no doubt. So, did Littlefinger have a hand in Joffrey's death? Well, he's certainly devious enough to do so, and he's given himself a great alibi by not attending the wedding. And it wouldn't be the first time he's tried to frame Tyrion Lannister either. Who was it, after all, who told Caitlyn Stark that the dagger used in Bran's attempted assassination actually belonged to Tyrion, and that Tyrion had won it from Littlefinger in a bet? Exactly. But why would he slay the Sovereign? Think back to that conversation Littlefinger and Varys had about the realm in season three. You know, the one where Littlefinger says that chaos is a ladder. Many who try to climb it fail, and some are given the chance to climb, but they refuse. They cling to the realm or the gods or love. Illusions, only the ladder is real. The climb is all there is. 
Obviously, Littlefinger is an aficionado of chaos, and the more chaos, the merrier. And murdering a monarch is pretty high up there when it comes to creating chaos. Chaos, which would doubtless create many opportunities for Littlefinger to climb higher and higher up that ladder. Just as the chaos of war allowed him to rise to Lord of Harrenhal after he arranged for the Tyrells to support the Lannisters at Blackwater. So, what would Littlefinger hope to gain specifically from Joffrey's death? Well, if Dontos was whisking off Sansa to Littlefinger, then Littlefinger would would control what many characters think is the only remaining Stark and therefore the key to the North. Which would mean more power to Littlefinger's elbow. Or should that be Finger? He's already tried to take Sansa away before, but she declined. Don't forget that Roz warned Shay and Varys about Littlefinger having his eye on the eldest Stark daughter, and we all know how that ended for Roz. This time though, Sansa had little choice about leaving, as it might not be long before the finger of suspicion was pointed at her for Joffrey's death. And remember, Littlefinger was infatuated with Sansa's mother, Caitlin, but his love was unrequited. Wouldn't he therefore relish controlling Kat's beautiful daughter, Sansa? And it would also give him some revenge, just like when he betrayed Kat's husband, Ned. So, how would he have done it? Where did drunken Dontos get that necklace from? And why did he actually give it to Sansa? Couldn't the real point of the necklace have been to smuggle poison into the wedding without raising suspicion? And if the plan were discovered, Sansa would make the perfect patsy. There certainly seems to be no limit to what Littlefinger will do to get what he wants. As Varys told Elena Tyrell, Littlefinger would see this country burn if he could be king of the ashes. Oh boy, the more you think about it, the more it seems that Peter Baelish's fingerprints are all over this. But wouldn't he have needed someone reliable at the wedding to make sure the poison ended up in the right place? Now, did he notice that during the wedding ceremony when the Septon says, "'Cursed be he who would seek to tear them asunder,' we get a lovely shot focused on Elena and Loras Tyrell Oberyn Martell and Pycelle behind Marjorie and Joffrey. Hmm, intriguing. And so to the Tyrell matriarch. We know Elena's a woman of both wit and wealth. She isn't afraid to speak her mind. She's shrewd enough to be able to deal with Tywin Lannister, and like him, she's a master of political power games. But why would she want to bump off her grandson-in-law? Well, she's obviously not impressed with Joffrey's behaviour, to say the least. Sansa called him a monster when Elena asked her what she thought of him. And did you see the look on Elena's face at the end of the dwarf entertainment? A smart cookie like Elena could see that Marjorie would only be able to control the king so far. With Joffrey gone, Marjorie would be set to marry the much more malleable next in line to the Iron Throne, Tommen. Therefore, Elena would keep Marjorie away from Joffrey's crossbow while still joining the royal bloodline, which would help House Tyrell grow strong. So, how would she have done it? Well, Elena was definitely fiddling with something in her hands as she spoke to Tywin on the way to the feast. Could it have been a little something to add to Joffrey's wine? But she's too clever to risk it being seen like that, isn't she? She also makes a point of touching Sansa's hair and neck as she consoles her about her brother Rob's death, telling her that war is war, but killing a man at a wedding, horrid, what sort of monster would do such a thing? Elena could have taken this opportunity to pick up something previously planted on Sansa to do in Joffrey. Drunken fool Dontos did insist Sansa take his family necklace as a thank you for saving his life, and she's clearly wearing it at the wedding. But what's this? Is that a stone missing from the necklace after Elena fussed over Sansa? I think it is. And what's that little clink we hear and that little motion of the arm we see as Elena walks past Marjorie's table? Did she pass the poison stone from Sansa's necklace onto Marjorie or into Joffrey's goblet? So could Elena be in cahoots with Littlefinger? She'd certainly be a reliable person to have on the ground and the Tyrells have much to gain. When no one does anything to aid the choking Joffrey, Elena does order the wedding guests to help their kids. Was this a genuine desire to help or a clever way to take suspicion from herself? If Elena were behind this plot, all this would come with a delicious side serving of retaliation on Tywin for forcing Loras to marry Cersei, which scuppered Elena's plans to marry him to Sansa in season 3. Season 4 marks the first time we've seen Mace Tyrell on screen. Lord of Highgarden and head of one of the richest families in Westeros, Mace was keen on increasing his family's prestige by wedding his daughter Marjorie to Joffrey. Surely that means he wouldn't have knocked off his new son-in-law then. Add to that the fact that according to his mother Elena, he's a ponderous oaf who places food above fighting, and we seem to be erasing him from the list of suspects. But hold on, his wedding gift to Joffrey was a gold cup, right? Yes, but it wasn't the gold goblet that Joffrey was drinking from when he croaked. 
Still, when Mace gave Joff his wedding gift, he did say, may you drink deep and live long. Well, Joffrey certainly drank deep. He wasn't quite so good at the living long part though. Was this just a case of the show foreshadowing Joffrey's death? or was Mace in on the murderous plan? He was sat next to Joffrey during the wedding gift presentations. Could he have poisoned the king then with a slow-acting potion? Is it possible that fathead Mace has more upstairs than Elena gives him credit for? But what about a motive? Well, his motive would be the same as Elena's, that is to protect Marjorie while keeping the crown. And now, the brother of the bride. Loras was possibly in earshot when Joffrey called Renly a deviant at his wedding feast and told Brienne he'd knight the man who put a sword through Renly. Add to that the butt-naked dwarf running about as Renly in Joffrey's vile entertainment, which led to Loras leaving the wedding table in disgust, and the fact that Joffrey told Marjorie in season 3 that he was considering making homosexuality punishable by death, and brother Loras has some possible motives. But if Loras didn't do the deed himself, but his family, say Marjorie and Elena, did, do you really think they'd have let Loras in on it? Probably not. After all, he did give the game away to Littlefinger's spy and prostitute Oliver about their plans to marry Loras off to Sansa, thus ruining the Tyrell plot. So Loras is probably off the list of suspects. Since we first met Oberyn Martell, aka the Red Viper, in episode 1 of season 4, it's been pretty obvious that he's not exactly the Lannisters' biggest fan. Of course, he's not the only one in the show who could definitely live without hearing the reigns of Castamere, but he has harboured a long-standing grudge against House Lannister for their part in the death of his sister Elia and her kids. Remember that Elia, who was married to Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, was raped and killed by Gregor Clegane, aka the Mountain, when the Lannisters sacked King's Landing just before Robert Baratheon became king. But why kill Joffrey? Why not just knock off the mountain? An eye for an eye, maybe. Maybe the king's death is just the start. Oberyn blames Tywin and his family for the deaths of Elia and her children, as he believes that Gregor would not have acted without Tywin's consent. And as Oberyn told Tyrion when they first met, the Lannisters aren't the only ones who pay their debts. Then there was that verbal sparring session between Cersei, Tywin, Oberyn and his lover Elaria Sand at the wedding, where they traded mutual insults. That culminated in what could be viewed as a veiled threat by Oberyn against Cersei's daughter Myrcella, who was shipped off to Dawn in season 2 to be married to Oberyn's nephew. This is what Oberyn said to Cersei. In some places the highborn frown upon those of low birth. In other places the rape and murder of women and children is considered distasteful. What a fortunate thing for you, former Queen Regent, that your daughter Myrcella has been sent to live in the latter sort of place. So could he have been helped by Elaria in his plot to rid the realm of Joffrey? Yes, he's Joffrey's real father. But does that really matter in a world where siblings sleep together, brother kills brother and father scorns son? It's not like Joffrey wasn't known for getting right under people's skin. Just look at how he taunted Jaime in episode 1 of season 4, saying that Jaime had never done anything worthy of being recorded in the history book of the King's Guard. And look how depressed Jaime is in episode 2 of season 4 about being unable to fight since losing his sword hand. But come on, would Jaime have really offed Joff? After all, he's the first one to go to Joffrey's side when the young king falls to the ground. Fatherly instinct or just doing his job? His position as a maester, a man of science and medicine among other things, means that Pycelle has access to all sorts of potions and poisons. And Cersei's needling of him at the wedding festivities, telling him that his every breath annoys her, wouldn't exactly have put him in a good mood. But then again, he was sent away from the wedding by Cersei, who ordered him to tell the kitchens to give the leftovers from the feast to the kennels. So that means he was out of the way and couldn't have done it right? Not exactly, as we do later see Pycelle sitting opposite Varys during the mock tournament. Could he have been involved then in the murderous plot? Okay, we all know what a wily character Pycelle is, pretending he's a bit deaf or a bit old and creaky as the situation requires, and then leaping to life when no one's around. But Tywin's onto his little game, and Pycelle seems way too intent on keeping his head down and toadying up to whoever's in power to risk his neck killing the king. No wonder he's been a grand mason for so many years. 
Did you notice how uncomfortable Varys looked during the wedding festivities? Most of the guests were clapping when Marjorie announced leftovers from the feast were going to the poor, when the dwarf entertainers arrived, when dwarf Rob Stark was killed in front of Sansa, and when dwarf Joffrey humped Rob's direwolf head. But Varys didn't join in, he just looked rather on edge. Now of course Joffrey's vile entertainment would be enough to make anyone uneasy, but isn't Varys often better at hiding what he thinks than that? Is it possible the spider spun a wily web to kill Joffrey. Judging by his refusal to lie to the Lannisters about Shay when Tyrion asked him to, it doesn't seem likely he'd have the balls to off Joff. So maybe his unease at the wedding was actually down to his knowledge that someone else had a plot in motion. After all, he does have his little birds. Just before we leave you, let's remind ourselves of some appropriate wise words from Dwight Schrute of The Office. It's never the person you most suspect. It's also never the person you least suspect, since anyone with half a brain will suspect them the most. Therefore, I know the killer to be the person I most medium suspect. So, who do you most medium suspect? Tell us in the comments below. And while you're at it, remember to like our video and subscribe to Flicks in the City for tons more Game of Thrones reviews and interviews. And remember, if you're not watching Jan G on GOT, you know nothing.